we're going to jump right back into it. I'm not going to do a, a major recap of last night, but I do want to get into just a couple things. We talked about this function and, and what that looks like, but then we talked about God's vision for your marriage and what that looks like and how that we can, how that we can move forward and better treat each other honor each other, love each other, and walk through it. And I just want to do a real quick recap of what we said, that if we treat each other the way that you want to be treated, then I think this is going to cover so much of opportunity throughout our life and throughout our problems, and this will rid majority of dysfunction. This is Jesus teaching us his golden rule, what we've called the golden rule, that we do unto others as we want them to do back to us. And so we looked at it from a very real and raw perspective that you don't, nobody wants to be yelled at. Nobody wants to be ridiculed. Nobody wants to be threatened or called names or cheated on or ignored or punished. And if we know that we don't want that, then the best way for us to treat our spouse is to try to avoid all of those things. One of the other big things that we talked about was getting rid of the word divorce. We'll go into a little bit more in Melissa and I's session but when we talked about vision, that's one part of the vision. And then what does that look like? How do we walk that out? How do we flesh out treating others as we want to be treated? And we looked at the scripture where we pulled out that if kindness, tenderness, and forgiveness are given, then our marriage, our relationship, it's going to be so much stronger and so much better. What can go wrong with being kind to one another? What can go wrong with being tenderhearted to one another? What can go wrong with forgiving one another? And I want to touch base on this. I kind of whizzed through it a little bit. Bit last night, but forgiveness. I, I've taught a series. I'm actually beginning a, uh, to write a book on this. I've taught a series years ago, and the series was titled "Outsmart the Devil, Forgive." The devil. The Bible says the devil's number one trick, the number one way he outsmarts us, is to get us in unforgiveness. Unforgiveness breeds bitterness and anger and loneliness and depression. Unforgiveness doesn't hurt the other person. Unforgiveness hurts you more than it hurts them. You may feel like by you not forgiving them that you are hurting them. You are teaching them a lesson, but unforgiveness is truly, it's, it's destroying you from the inside out. So it's so important. Jesus said that we want to, if we want to be forgiven, then we need to be able to forgive because we read about how he forgave us. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So the Father forgave us. He forgave us of all that we have done through the power and the blood of Jesus, and he is asking us, do your absolute best. Make it a staple. Make it a absolute pillar in your life that you walk in in forgiveness. And I know that there has been some things that have taken places in marriages that it almost feels impossible to forgive. And there's people like Dr. Greg and our counseling group out in Round Rock and our pastors, our elders here. There's people that want to surround you, want to help you, and want to want to really guide you through and walk you through that forgiveness. But the greatest advocate that we have on this earth to help us through those kind of things is the Holy Spirit. And when we ask him, when we call on his name, he is the great comforter. He will come and he will comfort our hurts, our pains, but he will also, he is the empower. He is the one that gives us power to overcome, power to be a witness, power to forgive. And so when we give God the first place in our life and we walk through that forgiveness, then we can really, really see some breakthroughs. And then we went into, before we went to bed, and we're going to recap this a little bit deeper, but we went through never go to bed angry at each other. And I wanted to give that last night. I kind of jump through it just to give you the, the synopsis of it, because I know that when we talk about things like this, that sometimes it could stir things within your marriage, and it might bring up an argument or a potential time for intense fellowship or some of those things. And so well, I wanted you to know this is so key. This is God's Word telling us, we read it last night, do not sin by letting anger control you. And do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So it's so important 
for all of us in any relationship, but especially in our marriage, that we do not allow anger to gain control of our life. Do not let anger control how you talk. Do not let anger control how you how you go about your business. Do not let anger control how you how you touch somebody. Do not let anger get in, in the way of any bit of that because when we do that, then we have really surrendered the power that God has given us. We've surrendered under the enemy, and we are under his control instead of God's control under our own control. And then we talked about not going to bed angry, not letting the sun go down while we're still angry. And we're going to go through these five points a little bit deeper, as I promised. Okay, number one, it's harder to have a fresh start at a new day. Nobody, I'm sorry, bricks, that's number two. Bricks are added to the wall that divide you as a couple. When we look at that and know most of us when we've been hurt, I know this was the case for me before Jesus, I built this massive wall up around my heart where I wasn't going to let anybody in. I wasn't going to let anybody in because I was sick and tired of being hurt. I was sick and tired of being let down. I was sick and tired of, of trusting others just to let them break my trust all over again. So from a very young age, I mean from the third grade, I made a determination I'm never going to cry again. That all changed the day I met Jesus, right? Now I can barely keep my tears in my face, right? But when I made that commitment, it was not out of a place of toughness. It was really out of a place of insecurity. Most people that have a lot of bravado and, and they're macho and they're tough or, or, or ladies that assert themselves super over the top, it's not just because that's the way they're wired. It's typically because they're hurting on the inside. They have a breach in their soul. They have a break. They have a, they have a lack of security and they're projecting that hurt and that pain outside of themselves. And so the wall just continues to get higher. The division gets wider. And as the division gets wider, you start arguing more and more. You start speaking to one another less and less. Then one of you moves temporarily onto the couch to sleep, then permanently into another bedroom, and then, well, then we start getting the picture of what it looks like. Unresolved conflict at night, or this, this is so good, unresolved conflict night after night creates a relation, relational wall that becomes increasingly tough to penetrate. The continual cycle of ending your day angry can also create a feeling of hopelessness in your relationship. So it's so much better to get these things worked out, to do them in love, to sit down and communicate in a healthy way. And Melissa and I will be talking a little bit more about that. But I want to just give you, uh, just a peer into, into something that I, I, I just felt like was in my heart because I was contemplating, I was going over all the notes and looking at the studies and preparing myself all week for this, for this marriage conference. And I wrote something down for Melissa that I felt best exemplifies what God used her to do and what she was willing to be able to do for my life. I wrote this down just this week. It says this, you looked into my eyes and I looked into yours. You saw deep into my soul and all of its horrors. You peered into the broken glass that once eyes could never pass. Past that wall that I made of brick and mortar. I put it up to keep me tall and all else shorter. It was pretentious, even contentious, but somehow you snuck through. Before I realized you saw through the hue, the colors that once blinded all others. You saw the beauty lying within, even though I was drenched in sin. It didn't matter to you. You saw who I was to be and not the lie that surrounded me. For that, I am thankful beyond words. You have freed me, freed me to soar higher than the birds. The sky is mine. The world is mine. Not because of me, but because you were so kind. And that, to me, is what Melissa and God together has done in my life. I used to be this broken, hurting, and all it did was flesh out in violence and anger. And all it did was made me shut everybody out, keep everybody beyond a arm distance, an arm length away, because I was not going to allow anybody in. And then God, through Melissa, before I was even saved, God changed all of that. He was already working on my heart using my beautiful wife to be able to 
penetrate all of that darkness, all of that cloud, and she saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And that's what we could do for one another when we allow that to take place within our hearts. It's harder, number two, it's harder to have a fresh day, the fresh start to the next day. A good night's sleep can create a sense of new hope to the next morning. But going to bed angry with your spouse defeats that hope. Every marriage needs to feel the, tri the triumph of overcoming conflict and starting fresh from time to time. But when the next day starts with hard feelings of the night before, the fresh start is delayed and sometimes it's lost completely. It's so critical, so critical for us to work our issues out, especially before that sun goes down. Less sleep also hurt your health. Anger not only harms you emotionally, but also physically. Many studies have shown that quality of sleep affects our overall health. And when you go to bed angry, a good night's sleep is usually compromised. And number four, unresolved conflict impedes sexual intimacy, short-term and long-term. Going to bed angry not only kills the mood, but repeatedly going to bed angry creates an unhealthy pattern of fewer opportunities for fun time. Yes. On the other hand, there are other times when couples who work through their disagreements before bed often find themselves really open to intimacy. It's called makeup stuff, right? It sends the message to your spouse that you value winning the argument. It's what we talked about yesterday, that we value winning the, you value winning the argument more than preserving your relationship. That is key to us, all of us. We can all learn from this. We don't want to send, this is the fifth one, we don't want to send a message that me winning the argument, me winning this is more important than you. That sends a terrible message. The message you send to your spouse when you have a pattern of going to bed angry is that your marriage and your spouse's well-being are less important than you winning. That may not be what you intend to communicate, but it's often the takeaway from the other. How you handle the end of the day conflicts either builds up or tears down your marriage. So it's so critical that we all all of us walk through our marriage with the best intentions, the best that we can. And I know that none of this is, is just easier done than said. It's all easier said than done. But marriage is supposed to be work. People often feel like, well, I didn't get married to get a second job. Well, you got two worlds that have collided together, and you've got a lot of compromise that needs to begin to happen, and you've got a lot of agreement to come into, and the best way to go overcome all that and to allow the things taking place is to keep God at the center of your marriage. We've often heard the quote that a marriage, a family that prays together stays together. That's not just a fun cliche. That's biblical truth. We've been pulling that out in this series. Number three, and the final piece of this is this, love always wins. You can never go wrong with love. God says in his word that all of our gifts, prophecy, discernment, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, all of these gifts, every bit of them, special faith, apostolic, pastoral, evangelistic, prophetic, every one of those gifts, they are going to pass away in the day that we go see Jesus. But these three graces, these three gifts, they will always remain. Faith, hope, and love. And love is the greatest. So when we know that love is the greatest, then we understand that we can win on a better level for all when we put love first. John 15, verse 12, Jesus' words. This is my commandment. He didn't say, this is my suggestion. Hey, if you feel up to it, I'd really like you to do this. He didn't say that, well, when you want to do this, he said, this is my commandment. He talked about the old commandments, but then he went in and said, these are my commandments, and this is my first, that you would love one another as I have loved you. That's God. That's Jesus. That's him giving us the absolute answer to so many issues, so many problems that we face. 
that when we love each other as Jesus has loved us, we can overcome and we can capture victory after victory after victory. Remember what love is and what love is not. 1 Corinthians 13 lays that out for us. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love is never proud. Love does not demand its own way. Instead, love rejoices at the other's victories. Love never gives up. Love never loses hope. Love endures all circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, love never fails. That's what love does. We know that love is patient, love is kind. We know that it's always hopeful, it's always enduring. We know that love can walk through every circumstance, and love, it never fails. But we also know what love doesn't look like. Love is not rude, love is not proud. Love is not demanding its own way. Love is wanting the other to win with them. Love is not saying it's my way or the highway. This is the way that it's going to be. If you don't do this, I'm leaving. Now, we're not talking about if they're doing something that is sinful or they're doing something that is damaging to your relationship or your marriage. That's not what we're referring to. We're talking about that, you know, you like things a certain way. You want things a certain way. And your demand is, if you don't do it, it's over. Well, that's not love. And if that's not love, then that's not God because the scripture says that God is love. And love is God. So when we reread that scripture, we've done a series on that before back in the years where we took apart that scripture because God is love and love is God. And we replaced the word love in 1 Corinthians 13 with God. God is patient. God is kind. God is not jealous nor proud nor rude. You're right? We went through that and we just replaced word. And we get the character of God from that. And then when Jesus is saying, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, then he's given us this beautiful picture. He's given us this awesome understanding of what that looks like and how we can walk through that with each other in such a way that we can help one another be strong when they're weak and we can stand in faith and believe that they're going to return the same favor. Most of us, most, I would say all of us in this room, in relationship, you have something in your life that the other has the missing piece to. They have the part to your missing piece. And usually it's multiple things in your life where you are going to be made better when they are stronger. And so we want our spouse to be stronger. We don't want them to be weaker. And when we go against love, what we do is we weaken the fabric of our marriage because we're weakening the person that we're together. You may not feel like you're being weakened, but you are because we are one. The scripture's so clear on that, that when we are here on this earth, the man leaves his mother and father and he is cleaved to his wife. The word cleaves means to be welded. This pulpit is welded together. If we were to snap this pulpit apart, then we would see fractures and chunks of pieces of the legs left on pieces of the platform and pieces of the platform left on pieces of the legs and we would have emptiness and, and holes in ourselves and, and we would have just dysfunction at a very high level. And so we are welded together. So I'm going to end this session with just a couple words of wisdom and advice. Melissa and I have been married 25 years. It has been the best 25 years of my life. I have been married longer than not married. We got married. I'm just going to tell you just a little bit of our story. Most of you know a lot of it, but I'm going to give you some of the inner snippets of it. We got married when she was 18 years old and I was 19. She was 18 by three months. I proposed to her on her 18th birthday. I'm just going to get super real for a second, okay? Okay. I proposed to her on her 18th birthday. When she got saved, I led her to Jesus before I was saved. And when I led her to Jesus, and I told her about the truth, and she gave her heart to Jesus, she came back to me and said, I, I gave my heart to Jesus, Chris, and he she's bawling her eyes out the next day. And I'm like, this is awesome. This stuff works. Like, I don't know how it can work for me, but I'm glad it worked for her. But then she told me, but for me, you told me not to look at your life as an example, but I want you to look at mine as an example. For me, there's no more partying. 
There's no more doing this. There's no more doing that. I was like, whoa. Hold on. Got me a Jesus freak here. She is dead serious about it. But I begged like a schoolboy. I'm just telling you, super real. I've never talked about this publicly. I begged like a schoolboy on her 18th birthday because I was about to ship off the Marine Corps and go to Desert Storm. I pulled out all the stops. I begged like a schoolboy. Baby, I'm about to go to war. I may never feel the warmth of your touch again. I put a ring on it. I mean, that's almost married. And lo and behold, after hours of begging, she finally caved. And hear this now. I'm telling you this for a very specific reason. She finally caved. I went to, I, I shipped off the next day. I was gone three and a half months. And halfway through boot camp, I started getting all kinds of letters from Melissa. My mail got lost, and I got a huge stack at once. So I read them by the date that they were stamped. And they started talking like this, that I think I'm pregnant. I'm pretty sure I'm pregnant. I took a home pregnancy test. It says I'm pregnant. I'm going to the doctor. I really need to hear back from you. I am definitely pregnant. Why are you not, re why are you not responding to me? Number five was, okay, blah, 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 blah. Not so much Christian talk in that letter. <laughs> so you're just going to abandon me and your child? Right? So we started off about as about as in the hole as you could start off. We were too young technically by, you know, most people's standards to be married. We both came from highly dysfunctional families. We've never seen a good marriage our entire life. And now we got a baby on the way and we're not even technically married yet. I'm in boot camp coming home for a few days after boot camp and then I'm shipping off to Marine Combat Training, sniper school and then, oh, you know, I'm just going, it's, 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 it's on like Donkey Kong from that moment and we're starting off like that. I didn't see Melissa but one one month of the entire nine months of her pregnancy. And it was the last month, the three weeks right before Candace was born. It was so cute when we were in St. Louis, Candace turned 16 years old, and, and the doctors, the military doctors, had screwed up the due date like 10 times. And they ended up inducing Melissa's labor, and Candace was born actually two weeks early. But I never told her how early she was born. I just always told her she was premature. So one day when she turned 16, she came down, I was reading the Bible, and, and she said to me, you know, Dad, I heard from God. She wasn't allowed to date till she was 16, and she said, Dad, I heard from God. God spoke to me in my room today. You wouldn't believe it. It was like an audible voice came to me. I said, what did he say, honey? And she said, he told me that I'm not supposed to date till I'm 18. And I was like, yes, that's definitely the Lord. There's no doubt about it. And then she said, but then I was up in my room doing some thinking, Dad. And I said, and she said, you said I was born premature. I said, yeah, you were, honey. She said, but, but Dad, you know, you and Mom got married in December. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, oh, crap, here it goes, you know. <laughs> and she's like, and, and, and you got married in December, and, and I was born in June. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you got married, like, late December, and I was born in early June. Yeah, babe, what's, what's the point here? You know, well, I've been doing the math, Dad. Was I really three and a half months early? I said, well, baby, you were just, you were premature. And she said, Dad, answer the question. Was I born three and a half months early? I said, not exactly. She said, how early? I said, oh, a little bit of that three and a half months. She said, what was it, Dad? I said, you were born two weeks. Oh, my God. I was conceived out of wedlock. She just started screaming and crying. <laughs> but I know this to be true. There are no such things as accidental babies. That's the greatest gift God's ever given me. Right? Most and I are blessed every day by Candace. They're just accidental parents. Right? But in the end, my point is, and I'm wrapping it up with this, we started off as dysfunctional as you possibly could. I wasn't living for God. She was. I was angry. She wasn't mostly angry. <laughs> right? We had a baby out of wedlock. Well, we conceived a child out of wedlock. We were married super young. I was in the Marine Corps. I was deployed all the time. For the first five years of our marriage, we tallied it up. I saw her about 40% of the first five years of our marriage. 
And ever since then, we have faced problems. We have, we have, we have messed up. We've fallen short at, in different areas of our marriage. But the bottom line is, is we have kept this first. And keeping this first has kept Jesus first. And in keeping Jesus first, 25 years later, I can tell you with integrity, I hope there are many, but I don't personally know of a marriage that's stronger than my wife and I's marriage. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm not telling you that there's not those. I hope yours is. I just don't know your marriage that well. I just know mine and I know some others in my family, and we're doing really good, right? And so all of that said, this is not a gimmick, folks. This is not just a formula. This is God's spoken word. It's his written word brought to life into our hearts, and when we run by the only standard we should run by, I promise you, everything, everything begins to work itself out because God is at the forefront making those crooked paths straight. Amen? Can we just give God one big thank you for his word? Joy, are they just writing notes in their notebook, a uh, question on their notebook paper, or do they have cards? Okay, so there's these little three-by-five cards on your table. If you got some questions, if you don't want your husband to see him, run in the bathroom and write them. If you don't want your wife to see him, just cover it up somewhere. But just write those questions down, and then we're going we're gonna to pass. Actually, let's do this. We got the baskets ready. Where are they at? Let's put the baskets just by the door. So fold your questions. We'll have them by each door. Somebody be standing there at each door. Tom, can you help with that? Can you grab some baskets? We'll have staff standing at each door, and you can just drop those in there, fold them up so nobody sees them, and then I'll be going over them, and then Melissa and I will answer them at the end of our session. So we've got a break to 1110, then we'll come back together, and Dr. Greg's going to give us some Dr. Love advice. Okay?